Hey there, thank you for checking out this video. I just wanted to give you a heads up. This is a long one and it's all discussion. But if you're a drum geek and you really wanna understand why drums sound the way they sound, I'm gonna be talking primarily about one aspect of drum design. And I think you'll find it incredibly fascinating and even probably, possibly controversial. So let's get going. Okay, so several months ago, I did a video about the inherent pitch of a drum shell and does it matter? Do we care? Does it, you know, are you gonna tune the drum to that? And is it gonna sound good if you do it? And I'll link to that below. If you haven't seen that, you might find that interesting. It's my first attempt at sort of discussing kind of the acoustic properties, some of the physics of drums. Uh, drum design. In that video, I alluded to, well, frankly, I stated that I was going to start doing videos that talked about drum sound and why they sound the way they do. So this is my first installment officially of discussing the design of drums, the physics of drums, why they sound the way they do. In my adult life, uh, I've spent playing drums and recording drums and learning all about why drums sound the way they do. And all of that began when I was 14 years old. The cognitive part of actually considering and thinking about it began when I was 14 years old. I had, for several years by that point, been grabbing every drum catalog I could find from any manufacturer. I just, you know, I would write to companies, please send me a catalog, and most of them did, and I just was absorbing drums. And in 1982, when I was 14, in eighth grade, Sonar released a catalog, and I have a copy of it right here. Because of the fabulous interwebs, and a little shout out to drumarchive.com, they have tons of companies' catalogs scanned. You can view them, download them. And so I downloaded this one. This is the catalog that I got. Here's a PDF of it. But I actually had this in my grubby little paw when I was 14 years old. Reading it instead of reading my school books, basically. Shh, don't tell my kids. And it's interesting for a drum catalog because it not only discusses their product line, but it actually talks about the design of their product line, specifically drum sounds, the acoustics, the properties, contributing factors, et cetera. And it's the first time that I had seen that. So in this section at the beginning, titled Research, I'll get a little bit bigger here, and basically start reading. So <clears throat> buckle up. The sound of a drum as perceived by the auditor, I love that, the auditor, the person listening to it, consists of a fundamental tone as well as the overtones belonging to it. Now, Sonar is a German company. This was almost certainly written in German and then translated into English. And I take exception with their choice as a native English speaker, with their choice of the word tone in this application because what they really mean is pitch or note. So, the sound of a drum is perceived by the listener consists of a fundamental note as well as the overtones belonging to it. Basically, it's the fundamental note tone that makes us hear low or high-pitched sounds. So one's tuned high, one's tuned low. That's a pitch we're talking about. The overtones are responsible for the characteristic sound of the instrument. This is true not only for drums. You could have many instruments, uh, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, trumpet, piano, etc., all playing the same prime note, prime unison note. But the overtones associated with each instrument would reveal that one's a trumpet, one's an acoustic guitar, one's an electric guitar, one's a piano. And so the same is true for the drum. You might be able to tune a drum to a note. I don't really ever take that approach. I'm not going to get into it right now. But assuming that you do that, it's still gonna sound like a drum when you hit it because of all the overtones and the transients and, and amplitude related to those overtones, the big spike at the beginning and the fact that it decays and all that kind of stuff. So all of that's gonna tell you it's a drum. Those are the overtones that gives you the characteristic, the timbre of the instrument. The more overtones it has, the brighter and more brilliant the sound. With fewer overtones, the sound will be softer and darker. Again, I take issue with their choice of words in English translation. They say it will be softer and darker. What they mean is the perception will be softer and darker. It's not actually softer, and we'll get into that later. The head and shell of a drum have different functions which contribute to the sound. So they talk about the drum head first. The drum head. The drum sound starts with the head. The air above and below the head will start to vibrate when it is struck or, as the scientists say, stimulated. 
This means the head is not only the sound generator, but also the acoustic projecting element. The better the head can vibrate, the more effective the energy can be transformed into sound. That's pretty straightforward. Makes sense. Let us continue. Furthermore, the sound quality of a drum is influenced by the material of the specific drum head. Depending on the mass and structure of a head, the overtones have longer or shorter decay. Drum heads with short overtone decay, such as pinstripe or CS, which is controlled sound, the black dot heads um, that Remo made at the time and, and still make, seem to have more distinct fundamental tones. Again, we're talking notes. The pitch of those drums is a little more distinct with those heads and sound softer and darker. Again, we're talking perception. I will come back to that. So let's move on to the drum shell. According, oh, <laughs> this is so fun. Here we go. According to scientific discoveries, the drum shell itself is acoustically passive. The drum shell itself is acoustically passive. Okay, we're talking about an ideal here. They're not saying that that thin, rigid drum set that you just bought, all those thin, rigid, six-ply, super skinny maple shell drums that resonate really easily, that those shells are passive. They are not. They're talking about an ideal here, and they're talking about their objective as builders of drums. And if you're familiar with the Sonar product line of 1982, even their, quote, Sonar Light drums are heavy as crap and I'm all for it, let's keep going. The shell does not contribute notably to the sound projection, rather, the frequency of the drum sound is determined by its dimensions. The bigger the drum shell, the greater the vibrating air column above and below the head will be. Accordingly, the fundamental tone, note, of a bigger drum will be lower than that of a smaller drum, provided they are tuned the same way. So all things being equal, a bigger drum will have a lower note. Shocker, we well, you know that. Okay, moving on. Therefore, the shell influences only the vibrations of the head and its sound projection. Remember, we're talking ideal. The shell is passive. What does it do? It only influences only the vibrations of the head and its sound projection. So it works for the heads. The heads are the star here. In order to fulfill this function in the best possible way, again, we're talking objective and opinion, they believe the best possible drum design would mean that the shell of a drum has to meet the following criteria. So their ideal drum will have this as the criteria. <clears throat> the shell must not vibrate. When's the last time you heard that? Have you ever heard that? If you're less than 25 years old, I don't think you've ever heard that. I heard that at 14, and it has stuck with me ever since. The shell must not vibrate in order not to deprive vibration energy of the drum head by its own vibrations. What does that mean? That means that there is a fixed amount of energy when you strike a drum. You transfer a certain amount of energy from the tip of that drumstick into that drum head. If the drum is well-tuned, where you've got, say, it's a tom, two heads, and the heads are tuned in a complementary way where you get nice resonance and sustain, what's going to happen? You've got relatively thin heads, right? Let's say they're just medium weight, 10 mil, average single-ply heads, right? And they're tuned well. If that energy stays in those heads, they're going to resonate for an amount of time, whatever that might be. If some of that energy gets bled off into the shell, exciting the shell, the mass of the shell into vibration of its own. It's taking that energy from the heads in order to excite the shell. It is literally robbing energy from the heads, which means that the heads will not vibrate as long. You will have shorter sustain on a drum that has a shell that's easy to vibrate. That may or may not make sense to you when you immediately hear it, but think again, fixed amount of energy stays in the heads, they vibrate. Some of that energy gets bled off into the shell and the heads have less energy, and so they do not sustain as long. That is just reality of fixed energy being split in order to excite two bodies at rest, the heads being one, and the shell being another, right? Inertia, a body that's at rest tends to stay at rest. It takes a lot of energy to get it moving. 
You take that energy from the heads, there's not as much energy in the heads to keep them moving. So hold on to that thought, because this is true. So hold on to that thought. Moving on. The shell must have a high flexional resistance. The higher the flexional resistance, the less chance of the shell producing its own vibrations. I'm not going to spend time on this right now. Flexional resistance basically just means that the material that the shell is made of doesn't flex very easily. If it's got a high flexional resistance, it's very rigid. It's not going to flex much. This takes a little unpacking to fully understand and isn't related necessarily to what I'm trying to keep this video about. So I'll move on. Lord willing, we'll come back to that in the future in another video. Let's move on. The next one, the shell must have a great mass, thus making the decay of the drum. Again, we're talking about decay because the heads, we want to keep the energy in the heads so it gets as much decay as possible, the longest sustain. The shell must have a great mass. It must be heavy, thus making the decay of the drum sound to a large extent independent from the way it's fixed to holders and stands. About this time, 1982, I guess that's kind of around the time that Gary Geiger introduced RIMS, the Resonance Isolation Mounting System, some variation of which has made its way into every manufacturer's catalog, trying to create a situation where the shell is free to vibrate and resonate to its fullest extent, thereby producing the best drum sound, right? I'm not throwing shade on that. My drums, all of them have rims type mounts on them. They all have isolation mounts. It does make a difference and I do like generally what they do. However, the argument they're making here is really true. If the shell is so massive that the heads really can't excite it into to motion, then it really doesn't matter that there's a bracket bolted to the side and it's hanging all the gravity of the weight is pushing on the shell and keeping the shell from vibrating, which is what it's doing when you have something bolted to the side of the shell and all the weight of the drum shell is being focused on that, on that point and putting stress on the shell. It keeps the shell from vibrating. If the shell was so heavy to begin with that it didn't vibrate, then it's not really going to sound different to have it just bolted. So just keep that in mind, all right? Furthermore, it favors an efficient projection of the fundamental tone. Then they mention another thing about the shell that I'm not going to get too into here. They say the frictional loss at the inside of the shell has to be kept as small as possible. A low frictional loss means more effective transform transformation of the head vibrations into sound. Frictional loss, basically a smooth interior texture to the shell. Whether it's metal, whether it's lacquer, whether it's whatever. You know, sand that wood and smooth it out, right? So that you can transfer more of the head vibrations into sound. Again, that's kind of another topic. We'll get to that in a future video. This next section is not terribly important to our discussion today because it talks about the bearing edge, and that's another discussion for another video, which I will get to. Just give me time. I'm going to skip over here to wall thickness of the drum shell. Thickness and mass are two separate things. It's possible to have a low mass thick shell. It is possible to have a very high mass thin shell. But generally, when you're talking about common tone woods, maple, birch, mahogany, whatever that drums are made of. If you basically have a thin maple shell or a thick maple shell, the thick one's going to be heavier. It's going to have more mass. So this is related to mass in general. And I'm going to include it as part of this discussion because I find that this has been true in my experience over the last few decades. The wall thickness of the drum shell. Apart from the dimensions of the shell, the wall thickness also influences the sound quality of the fundamental tone. Again, wall thickness, they're talking about thickness and I don't love that they made this a separate deal because really it's kind of still talking about mass because the thicker drums tend to have more mass. So the basic frequency, the note, which I'm calling it, will be more muffled, attenuated, less of an identifiable pitch when the shell has a thin wall so that the upper frequencies emerge. So lower mass, basically, the shell vibrates easier, and the result of that is attenuating the fundamental pitch. The pitch is determined by the dimensions and the heads being free to do what they do without interference from the shell. Once that shell starts to vibrate, you get some of that 360 horizontal vibration dealing with those vertical vibrations between the heads. It starts to disrupt things a little bit. The sound seems to have more overtones to be more brilliant and sustaining. Seems... Two, and I like the choice of words there because it seems to have more overtones 
to be more brilliant and sustaining. The truth is it has no more overtones. It just has less fundamental note. So a larger percentage of its sound is overtones. So it seems like it has more. It doesn't really. It just features them more because there's relatively, there's a higher percentage for that sound. And to be more brilliant and sustaining. Again, the sustain of the higher frequencies are easier to hear. And so that you hear the sustain, you don't really so much feel the sustain. So that is, again, a perception thing. It's not so much uh, an empirical thing. Moving on. Shells with a thicker wall and equipped with the same type of heads have the same spectrum of overtones as thin shells. So a thicker, more massive shell doesn't lack overtones. It has the same amount. However, the projection of the fundamental tone or the note, is better. It's clearer. It's more solid. It's more present. A larger percentage of the sound of a thick, heavy drum is its fundamental note. But it still has all the same overtones, all of the things besides the mass of the shell being equal. The sound, therefore, seems to be, perception, seems to be softer and fuller because rich, defined Notes, which are all in the lows of the frequency spectrums, even smaller drums don't have, you know, you're not getting above a couple hundred hertz, really, in terms of the pitches of those drums. It's way above that. That's all harmonic content. So the presence of those lower tones gives the feeling of a rounder, smoother, mellower, softer, fuller sound. So I hope that that makes sense. The reason I wanted to kind of start with this is because I think this is one of the things that is most misunderstood about drum sounds. And even people who build drums, who build very, very nice drums, will talk about the thin resonant shells that create resonant drums. To which I go, what do you mean by resonant? I hear people say that all the time, resonant, they're resonant drums, they're resonant drums. When I think of the word resonant to describe a drum sound, I think of Steve Smith, Journey, right? I think of Faithfully. I mean, listen to those drums. They're huge. They, they, they're, I, think, I think they're still resonating. They just go on for days, right? And yeah, Joel, there's lots of reverb on that. Yes, I know there's lots of reverb on it. But through the reverb, you can still hear the shells. They are resonating. Those are thick, sonar, nine-ply, beach. Those shells are almost half an inch thick, the sonar phonic drums that he was playing. And he used clear ambassadors, top and bottom, single-ply heads, no muffling. And they sound huge, and they sound rich, and they sound full. They're still clear. They're just enormous-sounding drums. Even given the technology and the trends of recording of that day, you can tell those drums are enormous sounding. And I love that. And so years ago, I ran across this red Ludwig, this red sparkle Ludwig kit behind me. It's a late 70s kit. And its shells are just about as thick as the sonar phonic shells. Heavy drums. And I had been using a, a thin maple shell kit at that point, a very modern kit as my sort of main house kit at the studio. I ran across those for a steal of a deal. I remember loving those drums when I was younger. So I bought them and I set them up and, and, and played them and stink, man. They was, it was immediately like, these are great. This is everything. They tons of body and they're loud and they're full and they're articulate and they're just, man, they're great drums. And they just became quickly and remain to this day my favorite drum set. I mean, I've got several drum sets. Ask my wife. I've got several drum sets. That's my favorite, Abs hands down. And I've made a lot of believers of people uh, who I won't name. But anyway, I I've made a lot of believers of people who love modern drums and, and all these nice, expensive boutique drum companies and stuff. And then they play those and they're like, dude, these are amazing. So I would love to see drum manufacturers embrace dense, thick shells again because it is fantastic. And why does this matter? Why does any of this actually matter? It, if you're going to mic a drum kit with a bunch of mics, two on the snare, two or three on the kick, one on every tom, a few overheads and room mics and all that kind of stuff, none of this really, really, really matters because you're going to have a lot of control over that. And you can kind of 
kind of make them do what you want for the most part. The one exception, which is worth noting, is if you want to really long sustain a lot of decay, a lot of what people would call resonance. But again, I'm not sure what people mean. The word resonance could mean sustain, which is what I think people generally mean. Lots of sustain. They resonate, right? If that's what they mean, then they're 180 degrees wrong because the thinner shells resonate less. That is, they sustain less. They have less decay. It feels like this catalog says, it feels like it has lots of decay because you're hearing the harmonic content more. But the real decay is in the fundamental note. And just because the drums are heavier doesn't mean they have less of the overtones. The other meaning of resonance could be talking about a frequency content, like an electronic filter, like a resonance filter, like on a Moog synthesizer or something where it's like a notch where it's really boosting a mid-range harmonic or something to the point where it starts to oscillate on it, feedback on itself and things like that. When you think of resonance as being that sort of edgy mid-range kind of thing, then to say that a thin shell resonates is kind of true because it is a brighter, more harmonic sound. It's not hopefully annoying like we would think of an electronic filter, a resonance filter, but it is a brighter, more harmonic sound. So that would be true. I don't think that's what they mean, though. I think when they say resonance, they mean it sustains more. If you really want sustain, get thick drums, heavy, dense drums. And then you record them, put all your mics on them. And if you later go, you know what? It's a little overwhelming. <laughs> Let's just back that off a little bit. You can use downward expansion or noise gating or whatever. You can use various side chain compression from other drums. You can do things to contain the resonance down to what you want it to be. If on the other hand, it's not there to begin with, and you decide, I want these huge Steve Smith power ballad journey toms, you know, and you've got this thin shelled kit with double ply heads, hello, you're not only attenuating the high frequency with the double ply heads, you're attenuating the fundamental with the thin shells. You've just got quieter drums all the way around. So I'm not, again, hope I didn't just frustrate or anger somebody. I'm not trying to do that, but eh, that's kind of what you're doing. Anyway, if you've recorded something and you decide you want more sustain than what you captured, yeah, you can use compression to kind of make things feel longer and all that kind of stuff, but you're going to be treating the bleed. Remember a drum kit, there's a lot of sound from a lot of things in that kit bleeding into lots of different microphones. So when you process one of those mics, you're processing all the bleed too. So as you try to create sustain with processing, you could really kind of be creating a nightmare of trying to filter out annoying frequencies that are also being accentuated and you know, so better, in my opinion, to have everything that you want, capture it, and then process it to feature what you want. So as an engineer, I love thick, dense drums, typically tuned fairly wide open. As a drummer, just playing them and feeling them and just the experience of it, I love thick drums, <laughs> thick, dense drums, preferably tuned wide open. So that's all the, this is, I told you this was going to be a long one. So I hope this is food for thought. Feel free to comment. Um, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this. Is this new to you? Um, does this confirm your experience? Is your head exploding because you've thought the exact opposite? Are you mad at me because you think I'm a fool and you know, whatever. Be nice if that's the case. I still want to know, but let's be cordial because this is fascinating. I love talking shop with people, even if they don't necessarily agree. But I think, again, when you go back to just the idea of fixed energy, all in the heads, lots of sustain, split between the heads and the shell, it just doesn't sustain. And some people I have heard say, and I'll just give you an answer if this is your argument, I'll just respond to it proactively here. Because I have had people say, well, no, but the shell's resonating, and so it lasts longer because the shell resonates longer than the head's. Uh, if you've ever thumped a shell and gone across the room, maybe to listen to somebody thumping a shell across the room, it kind of goes thump, 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 boop, right? If you've got a really resonant shell and you're doing the thump test across the room, you're not really going, oh, wow, that's just, wow, that's resonating. That sounds amazing, right? 
But if you've ever heard rototoms across the room, they have no shells, but they, they're just heads. They, by the way, if you've ever noticed, played rototoms, they sustain for days, more so than their wood-shelled counterparts. Why? Because they've got this heavy cast metal frame that is the edge, which doesn't really absorb anything from the heads, so the heads just ring a long time. So if you've ever played a rototom kit or even have some little rototoms, you tune them to their mid-range, they just kind of go, doom. Whereas a drum that diameter and tuned well tends to go, doom, doom. And it doesn't last that long. Rototom lasts forever. Well, one's got the shell and it's a thin shell and it's vibrating. Yeah. And it goes, doom. So again, not trying to anger people, but if that's your thought process, you don't hear shells resonating. You hear heads resonating. You don't hear shells resonating. So that brings up a whole thing, which I'm not going to get into in this video, but I will tease it. And that is to say plastic wrap. Plastic wrap is a no-no. Ooh, don't do plastic wrap. Why? Because it inhibits the shell's ability to vibrate. Yes. Yes, it does. I'll just leave that there for now. More later. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy this kind of content. If you do, please smash that like button and subscribe and, you know, all those YouTube things that people say. Share it with people. This is super geeky stuff. Most people probably didn't make it this far. If you did, congratulations. Uh, you are a true drum geek. I appreciate you watching this. I really do. Thanks so much.